All right, everyone. Welcome and good morning. Thank you guys so much for joining. Uh, this is our 2025 uh, NMFE office hour. It is going to be super informal. I'm going to share with you uh, information related to the 2025 NMFE uh, request for applications, um, as well as answer any questions that you guys might have. Um, we'll walk through a couple of the different changes that you guys might see from a 2024 application to a 2025 application. Um, and please, along the way, if you guys have any questions at all, do not hesitate to stop me. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself, uh, place your question in the chat. Uh, either of those options are perfectly fine. I'm going to just make sure that I can see the chat here at the same time. So I thought that we would just start our office hour off by walking through the different tiers of the NMFE grant and making sure that everybody understands the differences between the two. So we'll start with tier one um, and tier one for 2025. This is probably the biggest change that you guys will see um, is that we increased the amount uh, from 20,000 per application to 25,000 per application. So what we were seeing there was that there were some single entities that were having um, you know, 30 to 40 participants come through and with having that many participants, it was becoming difficult to be able to pay the stipends accordingly with the limit of 20,000 per entity. In situations where there might be groups, so uh, a county and a tech school partnering together, multiple counties, um, whatever that might look like, we were seeing that when groups were able to come together, there was a lot more opportunity for funding in the sense that a single entity applies for $20,000 and then if you add on an additional entity, you can get an additional $10,000. So if we had two counties partner up, they'd be eligible for 20, while currently now it will be 35,000. So 25,000 for the initial and then 10,000 for each additional partner that you bring on. So in those situations where we had the groups applying, uh, they didn't necessarily uh, feel the pain of the $20,000 limit, um, but there were some single entities that were struggling with that. <clears throat> so in, in our 2025 application, um, participants are able to apply for that $25,000 per application for Tier 1. And to kind of walk through what a Tier 1 application looks like, um, Tier 1 is built with the intent that any farmer participant that would be coming through the class would be writing their own nutrient management plan and then turning in that plan uh, when they are done. Once they are done and they've turned in their plan to the county, they are then eligible for up to $750 soil sampling stipend, up to $100 manure analysis stipend, a $700 participant fee stipend, um, and so in that sense, you know, they could they could make out pretty well for coming in and writing their nutrient management plan and, and turning it in. Again, I just need to drive home the point that tier one is. Strictly for plan development, and that is why there's those additional incentives for the farmer to pull soil tests, to pull a manure analysis. Um, on the other hand, tier two is very educational based, OK? Tier two has a limit of $3,000 per application. That was increased from $2,500 last uh, for our 2024 application. So again, we kept that at $3,000 for 2025. Um, and as I said, it's educational based. So it is in hopes that this funding would be available to help you host nutrient management related activities, whether that be a nutrient management update meeting where you're bringing agronomists in and farmers in to learn about nutrient management requirements within your county. Um, it could be a field day event where you're out in the field learning how to pull soil samples. Um, I've seen a lot of different things um, that it's used for. If you have questions about an idea that you want to try, um, please do not hesitate to reach out and say, hey, Andrea, I have this idea. Could this work for tier two? Um, more than likely, we can make something work um, and we can chat through what that looks like. The biggest difference with tier two, as I said, it's educational based. Therefore, it is not requiring that a nutrient management plan be turned in for any of the participants that go through your field day event. Our hope is that 
this educational event will kind of shed some light on nutrient management planning to your participants in hopes that they might, you know, be, become a little bit more interested and maybe in the, in the future they would like to come through a full NMFE class and learn about writing their own plan. But this one's just kind of get uh, an opportunity to get their feet wet, to learn what nutrient management about, is about, and then also learn, you know, about what programs are out there that could help them uh, develop a nutrient management plan. The last piece of tier two, and this was new last year, is the addition of uh, the implementation nutrient management plan reviews. And what in the world is an implementation review? Well, these reviews uh, allow for county staff, uh, the agronomist nutrient management plan writer, and the farmer to all come together and kind of have a seat at the same table to walk through that nutrient management plan, you know, answer any questions that the farmer might have, make sure that the information that's in the plan is actually actually implementable for that farmer. So, you know, for instance, maybe that nutrient management plan writer uh, came across uh, a field that had some excessive soil loss. And so what they did in the plan was document that that farmer is going to switch to no-till planting. Well, come to find out when you talk to the farmer, they say, well, I don't have a no-till planter. So there can be that little bit of differentiation between what the planner thinks can be implemented versus what is actually able to be implemented at the farm level. And so these implementation reviews are not meant to be compliance ridden. It is truly an opportunity for everybody to come to the table and make sure that they're understanding what is in the plan and that the planner understands what the farm is capable of and the farmer understands what is required of them within their nutrient management plan. We have a couple different stipends that are allowed within this uh, implementation review. So the farmer that comes through is eligible for a $150 stipend. And then the planner uh, is eligible for a $150 stipend as well as a one nutrient management CEU. That CEU is important for any planners that are certified crop advisors. As a part of the certified crop advisor program, to uphold their certification, they are required to get 40 CEUs every two years. So that's just another little bit of an incentive piece to hopefully bring in some planners to sit at the table and have these meetings with you guys. Um, if implementation reviews are something that you want to do, uh, we are currently working through our first um, grant cycle of implementation reviews and I think we have four or five counties that are uh, actually doing implementation reviews this year so I'm really really excited about that. My hope is that come closer to Christmas you know um, December this upcoming year of 2024 I can have a couple of the counties that are, are participating in implementation reviews give a little bit of an update on how things went um, and we can talk through things that went well. We can talk through different opportunities or ideas that you guys have um, just to kind of share. And since this is our first time doing these, figure out what is the best path forward. So for 2025, we kept everything the same with implementation reviews. Hopeful to get uh, you know another second cycle going through the loop here. And um, as I said, hopefully come December, I will have more information to share with you all on how those implementation reviews are going. Um, if you have more questions on what implementation reviews look like, we do have a guide uh, put together about what is an implementation review, how, where do you start, um, who do you pick to do an implementation review with, what are some questions that you guys might have related to tier one versus tier two grants, um, and like just questions to ask the farmer versus questions to ask the planner. And um, this document is available on the Nutrient Management uh, Farmer Education webpage. Um, and I can, if anyone's interested, I could probably post a link here in the chat once I turn it over for questions. Um, but that that is a document that is readily available on the website if anybody is interested. When is the application period open? Now, um, it, it, it opened on the 31st of January and it will be open through uh, April 15th of 2024. So the, the kind of the grant cycle, the way things work is that the applications are due April 15th, 
Um, we will then review applications and we will work with the um, SWARM team at DATCAP to uh, go through and get everything approved for NMFE applicants. And I believe um, early September is when we have the SWARM allocation plan um, kind of pre put together. And at that point in time, we will notify you of, um, of your award and we can work through you know things at that point in time but it is a little bit of a longer turnaround time in the sense that we align ourselves with the swarm allocation plan so again applications are due april 15th um, and you'll probably hear from me throughout the summer asking questions on your application um, but you will not hear anything for sure until around september october time period okay i don't want to just continue talking and sharing i wanted to leave this as a time for questions and just kind of seeing what kind of questions might be present here in the group today Ah, I got a great question in the chat about whether the tier two application is a separate grant from tier one, and that is a great question. So yes, if you are going to apply for tier two fundings, it is the exact same application as tier one, um, but you need to submit it as it is a tier two grant application. And so when you're looking at the application, you're going to check the box on whether it says tier one or tier two. Then, if your next question might be, well, Andrea, I would like to apply for both a tier one and a tier two application. Awesome. That's super great. Um, if that is the case, that would be two separate applications. So you would open up the 2025 application. You would check the box for tier one and then you would submit, you know, your tier one grant application and then you'd go back, open that application up again, check tier two, fill that application out and submit it as well. So if you're interested in doing both, that is totally OK. That will be just two separate applications. If you're in interested in doing just tier two and not tier one, that's fine. One application, just check the tier two box. I see a hand raised. Kirsten, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. So if somebody already has a nutrient management plan that their co-op has written for them, um, but they want to join the class and start writing their own and turn in their checklist. Are we still able to pay them the stipend for attending that course? Great question. Yes. So you completely are. Um, they're going through the course to learn how to write their own plan. If they are able to get a copy of the database file from their cooperative agronomist and the co-op wants to share that database with them so that the farmer can continue working from the same database plan awesome that's amazing um if they don't share and i will say some are very finicky about sharing databases um but if they don't then i would just have them you know start a brand new database plan um and kind of almost start from scratch even though they might have had a plan in the past before but yes they would be completely eligible for the stipends to come through the class Thank you. And so looking forward to so this is our first year, so we're just going to see how this goes, but we'll yeah. probably go ahead and fill out the application for 2025 to keep to keep going with nutrient management for rotational grazers. Um, are we able to pay people like a, a, a lesser stipend every year for turning in their checklist or can you talk? Can you address that? Yes. Another really great question. Thank you for asking. So the way that our NMFE grant is structured is that it allows for NMFE participants to, if you keep applying for the grant every year, your farmer participants could come through your class every single year and update their plan and turn it in and receive a stipend. The only stipend that they cannot receive every single year is the soil sampling stipend. That is a stipend that they're allowed once every four years. If though, for some example, they have more acres than what $750 will pay for for $8 a sample, then obviously they can receive the stipend, you know, 
uh, more if they need to to cover the rest of their acres. But the intent is that that soil sampling stipend is supposed to help them uh, complete their requirement of sampling once every four years. In the instance of regular just participation stipends, I've seen grants do a bunch of different things. I've seen new participants come through and be offered the $700 stipend and then seeing uh, people who are coming through and you know, updating their plan be offered a $500 or a $250 stipend. There is no, I, I don't outline exactly what those stipends can look like. It's going to be purely based on how you fill out your application. You kind of have free reign with that. The only thing that I do place limits on is in particular reference to the max. So a max of 750 for soil sampling, a max of 100 for manure analysis, and a max of 700 for participation stipends. Depending on how many participants you have, you know, I've definitely seen where the max is 500 and then a renewal is 250. You know, people just kind of play around with those numbers uh, to best fit the number of participants they're expecting. Fantastic, thank you. And one more to that end. So yeah. what if somebody is just starting their initial nutrient management plan and they have soil samples from like say last year and mm -hmm. they're gonna continue to do this themselves. Could they collect a few soil samples every year as long as they're within that four year window? So they don't have to sample their whole farm every four years. And then could we still pay for those samples as long as they're on like the respective fields within that four year timeline? Yes, so if you have a farm that, you know, isn't sampling all of their acres in one year, they kind of split it up either in halves or in fourths, you can pay out that soil sampling mm -hmm. stipend to them in the given year that they're pulling those samples. Um, I would um, just, it, it's going to take a little bit more of keeping track for you on your end of okay, you're, you're giving me a soil sampling receipt. Uh, the soil sampling receipt is for this group of fields. And then the next year it's for this group of fields and just making sure that you're not paying for a soil sampling stipend on those same acres. Does that make sense? Yep, perfect, thank you. Okay, yeah, I have Andrea, a question. Oh, oh. oh, go ahead. So this is Stephanie in Washington County. Um, can I assume that the NMFB grant program is going to be cross-referencing acreage that's already been seg paid? Forty dollars an acre for No, it is it's separate. It is separate, Stephanie. So, so in the instant they... Oh, go ahead. No, please, I'm sorry. Continue. Oh, I was just gonna say so if they receive the forty dollars an acre seg money, they can come back after the soil sampling stipend and all that other for the same acreage. Exactly. And they can come through the NMFE program and learn how to write their own plan and continue annually updating their plan with the beneficiary stipends from the NMFE program. OK. Great question. Great question. I see a question in the chat. What information is required for reporting after receiving a tier two grant or what information is required if this is a reimbursement style like SEG is? Really great question. So with tier two, um, I should say with NMFE in general, when filing a reimbursement request, I do not require itemized receipts. The only documentation that is required when you file a reimbursement request is if you're filing a reimbursement request for stipends paid to participants. If you have participants that you are paying stipends to, I require a completed uh, 590 checklist to be turned in kind of as documentation that they've completed their plan. On your end of things, though, it is I should, I don't want to say required, but I highly, highly encourage because uh, the NMFE program does fall under the single audit system. And with that, you know, if, if you were to be audited, you would need to have documented receipts of, you know, the soil samples that were pulled and the soil sample and the amount of money then that you reimburse that farmer. If you bought lunch, if you bought uh, soil probes to hand out. Those are all, you know, additional things that you would need to keep uh, receipt reimbursement track of. Um, but that is not something that is required when you submit your reimbursement request to me. 
The only additional information other than the reimbursement form itself is the checklist for the participants who are receiving stipends. Morgan. Are you able to unmute yourself? Let me see. I am not able to unmute you myself, Morgan, and I cannot hear you. Oh. Hopefully you can uh, type your question in the chat, Morgan, if your mic is giving you grief. I know Morgan is working on a question here. Does anybody else have anything in the meantime? So I I got a question. This is Jeff Schramm with Ozaki. So we had a farmer that wrote his own plan last year and then he updated it and he wants us to review it. He just has a little less than 200 acres. But if we review that, so then with this, we do the, the smaller of the two grants. So that'd be the two tier one. Yep. So then we should be able to uh, Cut him a, a check for 150, then you're saying 150 bucks? E yes. So the way you would have to submit a tier two application stating that you are going to be doing an implementation review and then align in your budget oh. $150 for an implementation review. Okay. And so that's, that's yes. And so if that farmer then does come in with you and you walk through your plan with them and make sure everything's good to go or answer any questions like that, then they would be eligible, yes, for that $150. Oh. But you would need to outline that within your Tier 2 grant. Okay. And I don't know what Katie had uh, signed up for. So. And, and if that is something you are interested in doing, um, we are really flexible with budget changes and plan changes in the sense that if that is something you would like to do, you can shoot me an email and we can work through how that could potentially change your budget uh, and change your overall uh, plan. And we can work through that together. Uh, all right, thank you. Great question. Morgan has a fun question here in the chat about how do you recommend paying for soil testing when farmers are doing two and a half acre grids versus the one sample per five acres nutrient management plan requirement? Really great question. Um, with that, because of what is required for nutrient management planning is one sample for every five acres, that is what we are able to pay for. I, I, I struggle with that because two and a half acre grids is awesome and I don't want to deter them from doing two and a half acre grid sampling. Um, but uh, what we can pay for is one sample for every five acres. Um, and then the next question, are soil sample or soil test receipts required for farmer NMFE reimbursement or is having a copy of the soil plus report adequate? That's a really great question, Kirk. Um, and something that I might have to default to the other county NMFE groups here on the call. How do you guys keep track of um, soil sampling receipts? Because th those are those are documents that I don't necessarily get to see at my level. I think I, I know Morgan's and I don't want to speak on her behalf, but I have seen uh, reimbursements from Marquette County um, where Marquette County does provide um, where she has received like an invoice from the co-ops that pull her farmer's samples. I, I've seen that as documentation. Does anybody else have any experience? This is Haley from Trempolo County. Um, we do pay on, on soil samples and we require the farmer to submit a or the producer to submit invoices for those soil samples um and we're looking at 
trying to get a little bit more um, documentation on where those soil samples are, you know, specifically located. We have the numbers, the farms and everything, but a little bit more of a specific location, I think would be great for our end of our reporting, or at least for our purposes. Um, but we keep all those invoices. We also have like a county sheet that we've created that shows like what we're specifically paying. We sign off on it. And like we say, you know, 12 soil samples at this rate was paid on this date. So we have more of a documentation for the county side of it. So Haley, is that something that you also then provide to the farmer or is that something that they sign, you know, saying that they received reimbursement for 12 samples or whatever? Um, We haven't, but it's definitely been in a discussions that we've had is having the farmer sign it as well so that it's a better tracking mechanism um, on our end of it because we have had, I can't say that people have questioned us, but we want to have our you know, I's dotted and T's crossed on our end if someone sure. does question it. So that is something <laughs> that we're looking into here probably this year is having them actually, the farmers sign the documentation that they did receive funding. Awesome. Thank you, Haley. I appreciate it. Yeah. Anybody else have experience with documentation of uh, soil sample receipts that they would like to share before I move on to the next question? my mic working now? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Um, I, I just wanted to shoot in there too. Um, in the beginning, I was collecting invoices and I still do, but now I require them also to come in and we upload the soil sample results right away so that uh, they don't get lost or we forget or, you know, it, it just doesn't get done until class and it's more hectic. So it's one more like appointment, but it sure like helps in the long run. Because at those appointments, Morgan, you're probably finding all the issues with the field names not uh, pulled correctly. So importing soil test results with mixed match field names is quite the headache. Yes, I just get them in the nutrient management plan where they need them. So. Awesome. Great suggestion. Um, a question again from Morgan about in the future, could we allow for tissue testing for vegetable producers similar to the manure and soil testing? Um, that is definitely something that we can consider in the future. And suggestions exactly like that are what I am looking for all of the time within this program. Um, I want to be able to have this program be usable and um, implementable. I don't want it to be a burden. Um, and I want it to be beneficial to the producers that are coming through it. So if at any point in time, anybody has suggestions um, or questions like the one Morgan just put in the chat, uh, please send them my way. Those are things that I would love to dig into a little bit more to see if those are things we can make possible. Yeah, and Kirk, I will reach out to um, Susan and Kim in the SWARM department on their on, on if they can um, solidify requirements of the single audit process. That's just something I'm not super familiar with, um, but I will definitely follow up with, with what they would suggest in that scenario. Andrea, this is Stephanie again from Washington County. Um, I'm looking over my 2024 grant here, and I'm noticing that the stipend voucher and incentive payments for the um, individuals coming in on the one and one, it states tier one projects only. Yeah. Um, I So I only went for a tier two, and I actually put that I was going to meet with people um, yes. as part of my grant. Is that wrong then? Or can I yeah. not do that? So okay. you are not the first one. Uh, Kirk uh, in Marathon County brought this to our attention. Um, and so, yes, this is a fault of Andrea Topper not catching the language change um, in the cre previous tier two grant language. And so with that, um, in the future, it will read to allow for implementation reviews within tier two. Please do not fret. It is completely okay. known uh, that in, in the way that the language is, it's like, allowing education and outreach. So we're kind of making it a stretch, but please know that 
in your 2024 grant application, if you had planned to do um, implementation reviews, those are completely documented on my side of things and um, please continue yeah. as planned. I apologize for that, Stephanie, but thank you for catching okay. that. I was like a little panic here. I'm like, oh my God. No. I, <laughs> yeah, obviously I, I truly apologize. Tier twos, you know, quite a few tier twos have plenty of people that have an MPs. So um, yeah, I would just like to incorporate both that and the education component. So. Okay, thank nope. you. Great question, thank you. Ooh. Can we include forage tissue sample analysis? Another one that I will add to the list to look into. Thank you, Kirsten. Since we're asking about tests to include, this is Stephanie again. What about yeah. any of the um, um, pre side dress or any any of that kind of nitrate testing? Um, not so much end of year stuff. I mean, we've done a lot with even tissue. I like the, the tissue. I think that's great. Um, I've done the stock testing. That's kind of more for informational, but mm -hmm. um, that's uh, like pre application or pre side dress testing. Yes. That's a really that's a that's a great suggestion. And something that I have heard people doing more and more frequently, um, obviously in the sands, those tests aren't very reliable. But if you have heavier soil, I'm hearing more and more people kind of experimenting with the PSNT test and even some co-ops doing um, kind of like a grid sample PSNT to kind of help plan for their side dress applications. Um, so that would be definitely something to look into. Any other questions? Hi, Andrea, this is Brady from Grant County here. Um, I know you've kind of talked about this a little bit with uh, how we've partnered with Southwest Tech for the grant. I guess, is there anything that we at the county need to do or is that all through Southwest Tech that Corey needs to just fill out? Yeah, great question, Brady. So. I will say that there is absolutely no specific right way to do it because I don't want people who are in this group right now to hear me say an answer to you um, that could be different from what they're doing. So what I will do a general answer. So there are many different types of partnerships with tech schools within the NMFE program. There are types where the tech school applies themselves and the county submits um, a letter of support with their application. But the tech school is the financial manager, the tech school is the grant manager, the tech school is teaching the classes, and then the county staff go to the tech school and help support those classes. That's one way of doing it, and I believe that is the way that you guys are going to be doing it. So with that, I would suggest that you reach out to Corey and you know, kind of say, hey, we're still planning to do our partnership with you. Can I submit a letter of support to you to come to include in your application? Um, just to kind of say that this is what um, we are planning to do here in Grant County. Um, but I also want to let you know that there are other ways that you can work with a tech school. Um, there's opportunities where counties are the grant managers and then they partner with a tech school and they use the tech school's location and facilities. So the computer labs um, and stuff like that. So in that sense, the county is the grant administrator and financial manager. They just partner with that tech school to run registration, um, to run facility locations and uh, computer um, computer lab access. And I know there's a couple different other options out there too, but those are like the stark two differences on how you can partner with a tech school. So is that letter of support needed for then that extra 10,000 for that additional entity then? It is not required. I encourage it because then it's just a good understanding between the tech school and the county on who's doing what. And, okay. you know, it's kind of like your way of saying we're contributing this to your efforts to help in this partnership. Okay. 
Great question. Anything else? I do have a few additional slides that I can share um, that walk through the reimbursement form, the final report template for NMFE. Um, are those things that you guys would like to see or would you guys like to just keep it kind of this open forum? I think you should show a couple of the forms because it sounds like there are a lot of new people on this call. Most That's definitely. Nice. All right. So as I'm walking through the slideshow here and showing you additional things, please again continue to ask questions. All right. So what what documentation is needed? When are when do we have due dates and where can I find this information? So we'll start with the reimbursement form. It will be found on the NMFE webpage. Um, once you fill it out, you can submit it to this DACCAP Soil and Watershed Management email address, or you can send it to my email address. Both, um, both come to me. Um, the way reimbursement form reimbursement requests work, you guys are allowed to submit two reimbursement requests throughout the grant uh, period. The final reimbursement request is due on February 15th of the following grant period. So perfect example. We're just wrapping up our 2023 NMFE grants. And so um, coming up here in three days is the final day to file reimbursement for your 2023 grant if you currently hold one. And so it gives you time to kind of wrap up at the end of January to, to wrap up and get stuff completed so that you can submit your reimbursement um, February 15th. Again, we kind of walked through this already, but I'll reiterate it once more. Um, when you file your reimbursement uh, request form, you do need those 590 checklists for anybody that you're paying soil, manure, or participation stipends to. This is what the form looks like. I've had a couple people reach out recently saying, Andrea, the form's not working. It's not adding things up and stuff's all jumbled up. There are two reasons why that happens. The first one is because we have to go through the grant, the go through the reimbursement form and enter zeros in every single category. I apologize, but in order for the form to calculate appropriately, it needs to have zeros in any of the cells that you're not requesting reimbursement from. Once you go through and enter those zeros in, you should have smooth sailing from there and all of the equations should work properly. If for some reason in this column, uh, Appendix B and MFE budget award, if for some reason, let's say that you have 2000 in training uh, soil, si soil testing stipends, but you request 3000, this here gets all wonky and it can't do negatives. So if for some reason this column here is smaller than what you're requesting, the, the spreadsheet's going to break again. If for some situation you've reached out to me and we have email confirmation that you had to move funds from your training participation stipends into soil sampling stipends, you can alter that budget category level here. So let's say you started with 2000 in soil testing, but you need to pay out 3000. You're moving 1000 from the training stipends so that this becomes 3000 up at the top. And then, you know, you're filling out $3,000 worth of reimbursements. Then this will zero out to zero. But if you had 2000 here and 3000 here, it will break it. So my suggestion is, is that if you've worked with me to edit your budget in any way, um, show those uh, budget edits within this table here accordingly so that you get accurate numbers. Um, some things that we might have touched on, but I'll quickly go through them. Can farmer participants receive a stipend every year they come through the refresher? Yes, 
completely okay on DAC cap side of things, but we do leave it to the counties to decide, or I shouldn't say counties, I, I leave it to the grant awardees to decide on how they want to structure that um, new plans versus updated plan stipends. Can I request administrative payments if farmer participants pay tuition to attend our NMFE class? No. So if you are if if you are requiring participants to come through your class and pay a tuition, um, that tuition cost should hope the hope is that those tuition costs are covering any administrative fees that you or costs that you might have. So if you're requesting that participants pay tuition, you are not able to file for administrative payments. Another question that we've had uh, many times in the past couple of years, can counties receive administrative payments for their staff time? And sadly, no. Um, the NMFE funding does come from the SWARM allocation, uh, meaning that the NMFE funds are not allowed to pay for staff time for county staff. Um, if you partner with someone that is not county state county staff based so in the sense of maybe um, a nonprofit or a tech school and let's say that partner is doing a lot of that administrative lifting for you um, where they might be doing um, registration they might be lining up lunch or you know just kind of getting facilities ready if they're helping you in any way they could receive the administrative payments but those payments cannot be going to staff at counties um, we've mentioned this a couple different times here now, but if you've underspent or overspent in a category and you would like to move funds around, please shoot me an email and let me know what you're um, hoping to move within budget categories and I can work with you to get that adjusted and changed. Uh, the final report. The final report is also due for our 2023 2023 grants here in three days on February 15th. Those can be emailed to um, my email address or the DACAP Soil and Watershed email address. Again, both of them come to me. Um, if you're wondering where the final report template is at, that is on the NMFE webpage. Um, the really important thing to do is to list all farmer participants for tracking purposes. I'm trying to keep track of the value of the NMFE program. So by ha by showing how many participants have come through the NMFE program, um, I'm able to kind of put a little oomph behind it, saying that we're doing a lot of really great work. So it's really important when you're submitting your final report to list all of the farmers that have come through your class, um, whether they were an updated plan or a new plan, and that is all kind of listed in the, the table within the final report. And again, I'll say it one more time, but any comments, any questions or suggestions on how to make the program better, please include them in the final report. I read them, I take them to heart, and I try to take those comments and feedback uh, into consideration with how to, again, tweak and modify the program to make it better. Um, extension requests. Extension requests are allowed for a one-year time period. So for example, back in December, if people had a 2023 grant that they were not able to spend within this first year, they can request an extension of that grant for one year. Okay, so our 2023 grants can be extended into 2024. If you are filing for an extension, um, I, I usually email, or I do email out all of our uh, awardees and let them know that, hey, here's the grant extension request document. Um, please email it back to me by December 31st, and um, I will work through getting extensions uh, pushed through for your 2023 grants. If there is anybody on the call today that says, oh no, I have a 2023 grant and I did not submit a extension request, uh, give me a call, shoot me an email, and uh, we can work through some things for you specifically. Um, and then the other question I get related to reimburse, or excuse me, related to extension requests is that by the time that we have our deadline of December 31st for extension requests, sometimes you don't have all of the numbers pulled together yet for NMFE reimbursements, and that's okay. Send a uh, extension request in for the amount of money that you think you will have left over. And if for some reason, when you send in your reimbursement request, that amount of money is less than what you requested, we will just automatically adjust to whatever level is left. 
If you have more money that's left over than what you had asked to extend, again, I'll reach out and say, hey, this is what we have remaining for your funds. Would you like to extend at the level that you previously proposed, or would you like to extend at the amount that you have available? So again, um, I'm, I'm flexible with that, but I try to keep it so that it's easy for you guys to kind of guess where you're at. And then if need be, we can fluctuate based on reimbursement requests. And I always like to share the different resources that I have available to you all through the program. We have the NMF, NMFE online curriculum. This is available 24 seven. Um, it is a online um, self paced class that farmers are able to uh, participate in themselves individually so they can go through and they can watch the series of videos on their own time. Uh, at the end, they're in the middle of the screen up at the top. There's this button that says download the checklist. They can download that checklist and check off the boxes that they've watched um, the videos and then they can sign that and turn that into you. As documentation of completing the online class. I have seen this used a couple different ways. I've seen it used where they require farmers to go through and complete the online class on their own and then come in for a day and work on SNAP Plus update plans. I've seen it where they have live presenters and then they also pick a couple videos out of the online curriculum and then play the videos to the class just to kind of break up, uh, make the class a little bit more diverse. Um, it's here as a resource. It's here as a tool. If it's something you guys can use, please do. Um, if you guys have any questions on that, uh, feel free to to reach out. Laptops. I have about I think 25 laptops available that I kind of haul around across the state to different classes. Um, I also have one MiFi device that travels with me. So if I'm coming to your training event and we need additional Wi-Fi bandwidth, I will have that Wi-Fi device with me. If uh, I'm not able to make it to your training for some reason, I have uh, Cody Calkins, my, my co-partner, who has laptops down towards the Madison area that he's able to help kind of disperse if need be, as well as Dan Marzu with the new train and pest management team he has a wagon of laptops as well. So we kind of divide and conquer in that sense. Um, and we make sure that you guys get what you need that way. Um, train the trainer. So as Stephanie said, we do have a lot of really great new uh, applicants here in the program and I am available to do train the trainer. Uh, I don't mean to point Brady out, but Brady has done a really great job of reaching out to me and asking questions. And we've spent a lot of time working together and kind of building up his program from scratch. And so uh, if Brady thinks that what I did was helpful, uh, he can say so. Or if he says, no, Andrea is just a pain in my butt. I also understand Brady. Um, but my my point is, is that I'm really flexible and I would love to work with you and help you and train you and bring you up to speed so that you feel comfortable in your role. Um, so if there's any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, another partner in this is the Nutrient and Pest Management team. Uh, they are regionally based. Um, we have six uh, specialists throughout the state who all are available to help with NMFE classes. This document is found on my NMFE training webpage. Um, it's a really great resource. It helps me kind of visualize who falls within which territory lines, but also note that if someone isn't available to help you and they're within your region, uh, but you still need additional help, the team is really good about crossing boundaries and helping out where needed. Okay, I just have some additional share and learn questions here. Um, they're ones that we kind of have talked through in our previous um, NMFE webinars, but I see we have 10 minutes left. So maybe instead of doing poised questions, I can just open it back up um, for questions to the group of things that I just walked through. This is Stephanie in Washington County. Um, we've been doing this a really long time. I guess I would say, um don't try to grab too much maybe your first couple of years it looks very enticing and the dollars are there but you're going to realize it takes a lot of time to organize to work with the producers to get the plans and planning to get all their receipts to so um 
try to be a little bit realistic as to um, how much you can give towards the nutrient management. Just don't don't overwhelm yourself until you maybe figure out what you and your staff are capable of handling. Very true. Other questions anyone might have? If not, I think I'm going to stop the recording.